So I'll do a very quick introduction. Uh, Professor Douglas Brown uh, is retired, uh, which is why it's such a great privilege to have him among us uh, in Singapore, especially because they live in the States. So um, he has been retired for eight years. Uh, from my little conversation with him, he has revealed that little information to me. And uh, yeah, it's indeed very privileged to be in his uh, workshop. So we have learned how to use Tracker a little bit more in depthly and he is the creator of the wonderful, uh, if I don't, if you don't mind me calling it wonderful, uh, this software that we have been using in many Singapore schools, if I can say quite safely. Even in NUS also, they are using Tracker. So if you have not heard of Tracker, it's perfectly fine. That is probably because you don't teach physics. <laughs> But you should find out what Tracker can do. It's a fantastic uh, piece of uh, software that is continually being improved despite his retirement. Uh, okay. So um, next we have Professor uh, Wolfgang Christian. He's the creator of Open Source Physics Project. Uh, I, in a nutshell, um, Open Source Physics Project is a, a whole series of simulations which are released under the open source physics kind of idea where teachers and students can continue to change the source code to repurpose these simulations to fit every different context, whether it be Singapore or uh, in different parts of the world. So with that short introduction, of course, I do, know, I do not do a lot of justice to the great work they have been doing. So let me uh, let them uh, go on to their talk where we can all learn about a little bit more about uh, the wonderful work they have been doing and what are their future plans and yeah thank you so much how's that can you hear me all right well thank you Lukang and and uh, thank you all for allowing us to come and inviting us to come and make a presentation to you it's uh, we feel very honored um, so I'm, I'm really proud to be able to come and tell you about Tracker. Uh, I know that many of you probably do know something about Tracker, but probably many of you do not and are asking that question, what is Tracker? Uh, you can see what it is here, and, and I you know, hope by the end of the talk you'll really know something about what it does. Uh, it is free, video analysis and modeling tool, analysis and modeling, we'll see what the difference is. It's a project of open source physics, and Wolfgang is going to tell you all about open source physics, hosted by uh, the uh, Compadre Digital Library, uh, and he'll tell you a lot about that too. Uh, Tracker has been translated into 20 languages, so it's used worldwide, um, and uh, we're real proud of its, uh, of its success in, in physics classrooms. Uh, and, and not only in physics classrooms, but by researchers, actually. It's surprising. I get a lot of emails from people doing research that use Tracker. I've got a couple of uh, URLs here uh, if you want to go to Tracker's home or the OSP home. But, you know, they're long. The easiest thing to do is Google the word Tracker, and uh, those two websites are going to be, I think, number two and number three. It used to be number one, but we changed to... Anyway, you can find those websites very quickly and very easily. So uh, Tracker is uh, designed to uh, analyze and model videos. And when you think of uh, modeling and analyzing videos, uh, of course, the first thing that comes to mind is the idea of uh, motion, mechanics. Uh, and, and, uh, and of course, that is what it does. And, and that is uh, probably what it is used most often for. But you know. Part of the reason that I'm giving this talk is I want you to understand that, that it is capable of doing much more than that. We're going to see some examples of, uh, of uh, studying sound with uh, videos, fluids, optics. There's some e &M examples, astronomy, and, uh, and, and then some other interesting things like fake videos and stuff, which we'll look at. Right? The nice thing is videos really are everywhere. They're getting easier and easier to capture. They're getting uh, you know, you could download them from uh, YouTube. So they really are all over the place. And uh, more than that, you know, you might say, well, where am I going to get these videos? Am I going to have to shoot them and stuff? Uh, actually, Tracker has uh, a built-in library browser 
that enables you to go to, to places, uh, servers that have collections of high quality videos and, and, and you can do it that way. So in fact, let me just uh, open up one of the trackers. Uh, I have a whole bunch of, exa uh, of uh, trackers running here. It doesn't matter which one I open, but if I go to this and uh, click on this button up here, here's this digital library browser and you can see that, I'll close that, you can see that uh, there's various collections here of uh, videos and tracker experiments that have already been done. There's quite a number of collections here. Uh, if you look under the, the collections uh, menu, you, you find that uh, uh, many of these come from the Compadre Digital Library, which I just mentioned. Uh, there is a tracker home library that has various uh, examples of experiments and videos that you can use. But there's also a whole number of shared libraries, which are libraries that are hosted on other servers, and, but which uh, make the, their uh, videos and experiments available uh, to, to the whole world by, uh, submitting them, by, by submitting links to those libraries to me, which I then make available here. So you can see that, for example, there is the Singapore Tracker Digital Library. Liu Kang is very active, and uh, uh, there's that library uh, has many, uh, many videos. Let's see, and that would be that one right there. You can see there's many, many videos here and experiments on all sorts of different things. Right. Uh, now, so, and, and the nice thing about this is uh, you, you can, all you have to do to open something when you're uh, using this, let's say here, Mechanics, if I went to mechanics or something, uh, if I looked at this and I said, well, that sounds kind of interesting. Notice when I browse through the, the experiments, it shows me uh, some thumbnails, thumbnails and, and uh, short uh, descriptions. There's, there's uh, metadata associated with these. If I, oh, not on that one. But uh, on others, if there was metadata available, it would show up. Metadata would be like author, uh, keywords, topics and so forth. And I can search by metadata. That's why if I searched here for the word solar, for example, it would immediately come up and show me that here's everything that has the word solar somewhere. And it could be, it doesn't have to be in the title. It could be just a keyword that the author has added to it. And if I put in Lu, or maybe I put in Kong, <laughs> Lu is not so good by itself. Uh, we have, we have many, 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 many experiments that are associated with Liu Kang's name. So uh, it's, it's quick, it's easy to, to uh, search and, and find things that are going to be uh, of interest in any given situation with a particular topic or, as you see, a particular author. So let's see. Um, Open them in tracker with a double click, searchable, okay, and, and uh, so that's pretty much what we've done. Now, uh, you know, I'm going to show you lots of examples. The whole point of this talk is mostly just to show you lots of examples of the kinds of videos uh, that, that people uh, use and, and analyze, or that at least they have done. And of course, there's lots more out there that, you know, haven't been done or that I'm not going to be able to show you. Uh, of course, you're going to expect that I'm going to start with you know, simple motions and so forth, and I would, but instead I'm going to show you some of the, just a little sampler of some, some one, you know, that you might not expect to see. Like here, here's one uh, where this, this guy, uh, Gregor Steele, has uh, done, developed an experiment that involves uh, having a bubble that's uh, attached to a, you know, a capillary tube. And, and, the, and the air rush, rushes out there, and, and if you look at the uh, theory on this thing, there's a prediction that r to the fourth versus t should be linear with a, with a negative slope. You can kind of see there, this shows some, some of the uh, data that he got. And I'll show you, uh, I just have to figure out which one it's, it is here. Sorry, water rocket, no, angry birds. Here we are. Okay, here's the deflating bubble. It just, uh, this, is, this isn't the analysis. You can see there's nothing there. That's just the video. But it's an interesting video. And, and there, there's a, a nice way to analyze this. You can make what's called a circle tool. 
if I make a circle fitter tool here, all I have to do is hold down the shift key and click on the edge of this in three different places and it, it, uh, it finds the best fit circle uh, for this. And so it's easy to make measurements and, and get the radius as a function of time. And as you do that, then you can create that graph that he looked at and, and, uh, and, and compare that with, with theory. Um, another one that's kind of interesting is uh, some candle sound waves. Might not have expected that. Here's a candle sound wave. Uh, sorry, here we are. Here's an example of that. Here's a, a candle flame. Maybe you've done this. Some of you may have done something like this. Candle flame in a sound wave from a speaker, very low frequency, but and, and high amplitude, but it's enough that you can then see the motion and track the motion of the uh, candle and, and you know, get a, a sort of a, some direct visual evidence of the uh, displacement in the air that's associated with sound waves. Um, fake videos. Now, this is uh, from a guy named Rhett Alain. Is that how you pronounce that? And he's very clever. Uh, he's got a blog. He's got all sorts of interesting things that he does. And, he, and Tracker is one of his favorite tools. So he, uh, he's got lots of, lots of interesting things to show us. And if I come over here, let me close a couple of these things. Um, close that. And Where's my, where's my browser? Oh, I wonder if it, it looks like, uh, it looks like it failed. Well, that's all right here. I'll just have to open this up for you. The browser may have closed. No, there it is. Okay. It's already open right here. The physics of fake videos. Now, instead of, you know, Rhett Alain, uh, does take some of his the experiments he does and he puts them on into some digital libraries so you can get them directly in track of the way I've shown you. But often, instead of doing that, he just uses a blog, dot physics it's called, and he uh, shows that he, he puts the video up, a link, it's usually a, a YouTube video of some kind, and then he uh, and then he goes and he describes you know what what's going on. So here was a, a blog that he did where he wanted to look at uh, various kinds of, of fake videos. And, uh, and he has lots of different you know, types of fake videos you could get. And, and you see here he mentions Tracker. Come down. I don't know, that was some kind of a, a Grand Prix uh, lunar rover that he, you know, he's able to prove that uh, these videos just aren't, uh, they don't hold up. Impossible physics. Uh, he puts a lot of physics into this, and, and, it, uh, and, and this was a really interesting one, detecting fake shake. He's got a, an interesting video here, and uh, you know, maybe you've seen this, but see that ball bounces around, and this guy keeps hitting it, and goes around and Rhett said, I don't know, this just looks a little suspicious. suspicious. And so notice that the, that the video, uh, uh, you see how the, this is shaking? So the indication is that it's like a handheld video. And so what he did was he, uh, he, that's not what I wanted, sorry. So many things open at the same time. Oh. Yeah, he said, let's look at the shake and, and not, not try to measure the ball or anything like that. Just measure something in the video that's supposed to be, you know, that you know is a fixed point on the ground. And, uh, and by tracking that fixed point on the ground, what you're doing is essentially measuring the shake of the camera. And when he does something like that, he comes up with graphs that look like this. When he compares those with typical plots of uh, the shake that the, where, where he did some hand holding, now you come up with things like this. Anyway, he's got some really interesting ways of showing that uh, you can use Tracker to, to 
show that, uh, to essentially prove that, that videos are fake. Here was another example of one. Uh, maybe some of you were familiar with this Birdman video. Doesn't matter too much, but there was this guy that uh, claimed to be uh, claimed to be, you know, developing some wings and trying to learn to, you know, trying to actually fly, you know, human-powered flight and so forth. And he did this thing where he built it up. He got a following, you know. He would he would have a video one week where he, he failed, and he's and then he would go back and say, well, I, okay, I changed the design a little bit. And I'm going to try it again, and then he would fail again, and finally. You know, on try number 14, he, he presumably, you know, actually flew around and, and so forth and came down. So he uh, spent, uh, uh, Rhett Alain spent uh, a couple of different blogs here going through that and trying to figure out now how would you prove that this is either fake or not? Because eventually the guy admitted, okay, it's, it's a hoax. Uh, but he did lots of analysis again on, on uh, the motion of the, of the head of the, of the camera, the, because he had a GoPro on his on his head and so forth, and uh, I'm not going to show you the video; I won't take the time. But he looked at uh, he looked at distributions of, of of steps in the shakiness and 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 did a lot of analysis. He he really does some some clever things. So fake videos is a is a very interesting uh, way to uh, get get students interested in things. And uh, this is a little different, not such a fake thing. But I thought this was interesting. I got an email from a, a guy at Macquarie University who is using Tracker to, uh, with surgical trainees. So that's not something you'd expect, where he would take a video of them pr uh, practicing uh, sewing these, uh, these uh, blood vessels together. And then he would, uh, and he would measure the, the, you know, how the economy of motion, essentially, you know, how much they're moving around. And then he would compare that with expert surgeons, and he would allow these, these trainees to, to then you know, get feedback on, on what they were doing and watch the, the experts. Uh, very interesting application. So that, that's just a little bit of, of the kinds of things that you might see. And I'm going to show you a lot more of those. But let's, let's go ahead and start looking at some. Uh, actual ways that Tracker is used. And let's close that, Digital Library Browser. And so I will go back now and we'll actually look at some simple motion types of videos. Here's a, a video of, a, uh, of a, a ball that's been tossed out. And, and here's, I, I wanted to show this first because I want you to see that there is a way of taking a video and getting a lot of qualitative information about it. This is essentially a, a sort of a live motion diagram. And if you teach physics, you're certainly familiar with motion diagrams and, and how much information you can get with those. Right? It's a really great starting point. So Tracker uses what are called video filters to create special effects like this. There are video filters for things like brightness and so forth. There are video filters that allow you to rotate videos or to correct for different kinds of distortions in the videos. So Tracker has many of those kinds of things. Uh, if I, let's see, if I uh, want to take it to the next step, of course, I could use the same video and actually track the motion. By tracking the motion, we mean mark data points where the, where the ball moves. And when I do that, we see that we actually generate real data, real numerical data. Looks something like this. Uh, we can look at plots on here. You can, you can uh, plot you know, more or less anything you want versus anything else. We've got data tables. So the data is accessible to us. We can transfer the data. We can copy the data and, and paste it into Excel. But we don't have to. Uh, Tracker has something built into it called uh, the data tool. And data tool, while you know, not a general purpose to analysis tool, is a, uh, a, a relatively uh, powerful uh, tool for, for looking at uh, data in more detail. And one of the things that it has, for example, is a curve fitter. And uh, by default, uh, it, can, it fits a line, a straight line, auto fits it to uh, whatever the data is. And you see that you get the parameters here that give us some information. Um, 
And so uh, this is actually relatively fast and easy for students to take, uh, to take uh, position time data. Uh, data a, a tracker generates not only position time data, but you know, velocity time data. Uh, when you move that kind of data into data tool, you, get, uh, you can get information. Now, I, I actually transferred across this uh, position versus time data. Uh, what I'm really interested in would be, I guess, for measuring g would be this y velocity versus time data. And if I double click and move that into tracker, I see that it has a slope of about minus 10. Right? And that's, well, it's not perfect, but it's a video. It's real data. You mark it by hand. There's distortions. There's lots of reasons that one doesn't expect to get a perfect answer. Um, the, the data tool also now enables you to, to measure areas under curves, to measure slopes of curves at different points, and so forth. So it's a, it's a useful tool. And there's not just linear fits. You can do all sorts of different fits, and you can define your own fits as well. Uh, the third thing that you can do, oh, that's what I wanted to do on here. Um, you know, tracking an object, let me, let me do something here. I'm going to take this ball and clear all the steps. So I've, I've got this track, and I haven't marked anything. The, the traditional way of marking a, 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 mo a moving object would be to hold, I'm just holding down the, the shift key, would be to hold down the shift key and you mark it with a mouse. And, and that's how that's typically done. And that works fine for, uh, you know, for short videos. And this is a short video. But I do want to show you that there's also something in Tracker which is called the uh, Auto Tracker. And if I come down here, open up the Auto Tracker, the Auto Tracker is something that enables me to create a template. And then once I've got a template, I can ask it to search. go back. Yeah. And so an auto tracker is something that enables me to mark the data points automatically. That's maybe you go, well, you know, that's useful on a short video. It's really useful on long videos. And I did want to show this video that uh, is a, a student uh, project of Wolfgang's. Uh, this was a student who studied a pendulum on an Atwoods machine. And uh, the pendulum on the Atwoods machine, uh, as it swings back and forth, it, it moves up. If I scroll across here, you can see that the, you know, while it's swinging, it also is, is, is moving up as the Atwoods machine uh, sort of rolls up. This student used an auto tracker on here, and my understanding is ended up with about 10,000 data points. Well, you wouldn't want to do that you know, by hand. So it's impressive that uh, the auto tracker is something that uh, works, it can work as well as it does, uh, at least under some circumstances. You do have to have the right video. You have to have you know, some, um, some clean backgrounds and so forth. So let's see, I talked about the data, the, uh, data tool. Um, the auto tracker, I just showed you that, the pendulum in the Atwood machine, 10,000 data points. Um, the other thing though, remember tracker is called a, a video analysis and modeling tool. And the modeling tool aspect is, um, is this right here. Here's a typical model. A model is, instead of marking the data points, the model is something that you put in some, you tell it, you give it some forces and some initial values and so forth, and the model then uh, uh, automatically has a, 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 an ODE solver that uh, applies Newton's laws to, to these initial conditions and forces and, and uh, draws the motion that results. So that if, for example, I change G to let's say four, you can see that the motion of the model is quite different. Right? I can undo that easily. But uh, uh, this modeling tool 
uh, the, uh, the ability to make a, a model is really pretty powerful in Tracker. Uh, it has a parser in it that, uh, that understands uh, all the sinusoidal functions and so forth, uh, everything. And uh, so it enables you to not only look at simple kinds of motions like that, but also at more complex motions like, let's say, motions of, uh, I'll just come up here, here, this kind of motion here where maybe we've got a badminton shuttlecock where we know that air resistance is significant, but when you're modeling this kind of a thing, you put in an air resistance uh, force and you get something that works, you know, that, that can be surprisingly good. And students like that because, you know, the, instead of having to deal with always these simplified models where they go, yeah, but that's not what the way the real world works, you know, you can really extend this out where, where you're looking at uh, videos of real things that move on which, you know, real forces like uh, air resistance forces and so forth do apply to them and, and still get good, uh, good results. Uh, I'm going to step back to where I was. Um, I won't show you all of these in the interest of time, but I just will, you know, point out some interesting things. Another one that Rhett Alain did was uh, he looked at the free fall. You know, he took the idea of a free fall. Instead of just looking at a ball, well, let's look at some real things. And so he went out and, and found on the web again uh, a nice video of a shark uh, where it was tilted and so forth. But he was able to use, you know, you see how you can, you can tilt the coordinate axes and so forth. So he was able to uh, you know, get some pretty good data from stuff like this. Uh, uh, Ann Cox at Eckerd College also has something sort of similar where she, uh, she looked at dolphins. And, and in fact, I, I think I want to show you uh, that an example of, the, uh, of using the dolphins. Let's do this one here. If I open up this and search for dolphin, and I get this, let's see, yeah, if I open that dolphin thing, uh, that may, there may be a problem with that. Let me open another, I'm not quite sure. Oh, no, here it comes, here it comes. Okay, now, one of the things I want you to see, I'm going to close this new tracker that's opening up. One of the things that I uh, could have sworn, that was one that, well, it didn't do it. I don't know why. But uh, th this particular example is one where the, uh, the file that contains the video, it's, it's called a TRZ file, a tracker, a zip file. And the, the file that contains the video also contains some, uh, a PDF uh, file with instructions and, and questions and, and lesson plans. Essentially, it's, it's uh, support materials, support documents that go along with the experiment. So uh, when, when you're dealing with, uh, when, you're, when you're using the digital library browser and, and, uh, and looking for various kinds of uh, experiments that you might be pulling in, uh, you're not just pulling in videos. You're, you're often, at least you know, for good authors, you're typically pulling in also supporting materials. So there is some, some pedagogical uh, uh, support uh, to Tracker. Now, a uh, ball in an accelerating elevator. I won't show you that, uh, but another ready, a lane where, thing where he, he got into an elevator and took some videos of him tossing a ball up and down uh, while the elevator was accelerating up and down. And, and uh, it was a nice way to, to, to get students to start looking at accelerated reference frames. And, and they were seeing their teacher doing, doing the thing. You know, it was fun. Um, angry birds. If you've, you know, if you've, if you use Tracker at all, you're certainly familiar with the fact that a lot of people, you know, have, uh, especially in uh, high school and middle school and so forth, uh, have done some analyses of angry birds. It was such a popular thing. Uh, it probably no longer is as much, but, um, and a lot of people did some of these. Uh, you know, it was an interesting one because then it was sort of this alien world, so you didn't have a, a known quantity, and you didn't even always have, uh, you know, known physics, the, the sort of, Sometimes the angry bird, uh, uh, like the angry birds in space, would have physics that really was uh, not, not, not exactly real physics. So you could do some analyses and find out what was going on there. 
Uh, of course, you know, you can go to NASA videos. There's videos available from NASA, and some of those are really uh, interesting. There's a, uh, let's see if I, here, the Orion, uh, you know, it's real basic motions, real basic analysis, but just the fact that, you know, you're pulling videos off of the NASA sites and, and, and being able to look at, at real things and is, uh, adds some, some interest to these, uh, to these activities. I won't show you this, but there was a, sort of a whole rocket, I've got a whole rocket series. Uh, and this, my, my uh, talk here is a PDF file which uh, will be on the web, and I think you'll be able to give, uh, so Wolfgang uh, will be able to give you a URL so that if you want to you know, download this and go through this on your own, uh, in every, on mo almost every slide I either have something where there's a, a, some search terms that you could use to find it in the digital library, or there may be links to, uh, to, to web pages. Uh, so this rocket car is interesting, the rocket car took off, it actually was a rocket unit on a car, and, and, uh, and it went and it was supposed to go up on this ramp, but instead it sort of it hit the ramp so hard that it, that it just kind of practically crushed the ramp. Anyway, it's, it's great, great video. I, I recommend you go and take a look at that. Uh, water rocket, too, was another one. Wolfgang uh, worked with some uh, 12, 13-year-olds in school, and they, uh, they set up some projects where they, 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 they built some uh, water rockets, and then they went out and they shot them off and took their own videos, did some analyses of that, and uh, they were incredibly excited. That's a, that was a, so a, a tracker is used uh, by many middle schools, by high schools. It's used by you know, colleges in introductory courses, and, and then it's used by students uh, for the uh, student projects uh, that are even, you know, uh, can be uh, uh, upper upper division uh, uh, students that, that uh, can do relatively sophisticated uh, projects like that, the one with the, the uh, pendulum on the, the Atwood machine. Skydiving without a parachute, I gotta show you that one. Skydiving. Without a parachute. Here. Here's the here's the guy. That's him right there. You know, with the, the wing thing. He came here and he actually landed with nothing but the wing. He landed on a big bunch of cardboard boxes. That's a huge pile of cardboard boxes. And I guess he actually did survive the whole thing. But so uh, this is uh, another uh, Rhett Elaine thing, but this one is available and I just downloaded off the, off the uh, Compadre site. Height of a space balloon. Another interesting one where you're trying to get the motion of something, but you, know, you don't actually see the object. Instead, it was a space balloon that was rising and had a video camera on the bottom of it, and just looking straight down. So by measuring the, uh, the angular size of some objects around the ground, you, know, and you, could use, uh, you could then determine the height as a function of time. Uh, very clever way of doing it. Hot Wheels Loop is a, is a, uh, a nice look at a toy car tries to go around a hot wheels loop. And this is actually a, an experiment that's, again, on, uh, you can get this uh, quickly with the digital library browser. And it actually, there's a series of three videos, one of which where the thing's going fast enough goes around the loop easily. And then a couple others where, uh, there's one where it just barely makes it and this one where it fails. Um, these are models. You see the, the, the thing there that's, that's a, that's a model. Not a, not just the track. Oh no, that's I'm I'm wrong. I'm sorry, apologize for that. That's that is, the real 
the real thing that's been tracked. Uh, collisions, center of mass. Here's a, an example of uh, a collision. This is still mechanics, of course, but you know collisions are a, are a common thing to study. And, and the nice thing about tracker is here's, here's a red puck, a, a blue puck, and, and then uh, you can define a, a center of mass track. Uh, the center of mass track then is seen to move along a straight line, even though you know, even during the collision, which what you, you expect, right? But the interesting thing I want you to see here is that down here is a uh, is what's called the world view of that uh, same and the, the, of the collision. The world view is a view that is uh, is you know what you would see if you were on the center of mass. And so, if you were on the center of mass, or not, if you were on the center of mass, but it, it's a uh, uh, this is a, with a fixed, sorry, this is with a fixed origin. Um, but you can go on the center of mass. It turns out if you go up here to the coordinate system, you can change the reference frame and ask, uh, well, what does it look like if you are, in fact, on the, fr uh, the center of mass? And it's an interesting thing that, of course, what it does when you are in the center of mass reference frame is that both the pucks come directly towards it before the collision, and both of the uh, and then they move directly away after the collision. You can see that they're, they've lost energy. They're moving more slowly after the collision than they are before the collision. Some pendulum motion. That's a pretty obvious one that you're going to use in your courses. And you can model these. Again, I won't actually show you this video. You all know what a pendulum looks like. We can model them, though. You can model it because in Tracker you have models that uh, on which instead of giving them forces along the x and y axis, you give them forces along the radial and tangential axes. Uh, so you can deal with uh, things that move along circular arcs like this. The nice thing about looking at pendulum models is that you're not restricted to this small angle approximation where you want to see a uh, simple harmonic motion, but where you can really uh, uh, look at uh, larger amplitudes. And in fact, I got this video off the web that has not yet been analyzed, but I just think it's is ripe for it. It's one where there's this guy that uh, it's, it's sort of they sort of play in slow motion. But here was this guy on a swing, a giant swing, where the swing wasn't you know uh, ropes, but uh, were were sticks, and he he was able to. Uh, Pump it just like you would pump any other swing, and eventually got himself to go all the way up and over. Is he going to go over this time? Uh, no, he didn't make it. But next time around, next time around, he. It's pretty easy. He goes all the way over. Doesn't he? Oh. Well, I guess I'm wrong. Somewhere in here he does. Let's see. See that? He doesn't. He still doesn't make it. He's up there. He's hanging there upside down for about, you know, 10 seconds or something. But he doesn't go over. But he finally, finally makes it over right here. This is a video that uh, is uh, not uh, you know, so easy to analyze, but it could be done. Because uh, you, it, the tracker has the facility to correct for the fact that you're looking at this at an angle. You know, that would be a problem. And a uh, tracker could model something like this. It would be interesting. I think it would be really interesting to try to model the idea of a pumped you know, swing and see if you could, see if you could get his, uh, his pumping going. Now, uh, student projects, I want to. I want to just say a couple things about this. Um, students, uh, one of the most effective ways of using Tracker is to, is to uh, ask students to design their own experiments and capture videos. Spend several weeks, you know, two or three, four weeks doing this kind of thing. And when you do that, they, uh, they can learn a lot. So uh, I've got a couple examples. The top one that you see the picture of there was one where students modeled a cupcake. They mo it was the monkey. It's the, if you're a physics teacher, it's the classic monkey 
hunter thing, but instead of having a monkey that falls uh, with a constant acceleration g, it was a monkey that was a, 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 a filter, a coffee filter, and so it fell with a, a great deal of uh, air resistance, and, and in, in that case, uh, how are you going to aim the, you know, the gun to, to hit the falling monkey? Uh, well, the students modeled the monkey, they modeled the gun, and then they played with the models until they could predict. They predicted where, you know, how they would have to aim the gun in order to hit the falling monkey. And, then, and, and, they, and they did the predictions in advance, and then they went out and took the video. They hit it on the first try. It was really nice. The other one was a, a model of a cart that bounces off the end. Uh, here's, some, here's some examples that are getting away again now from, uh, from mechanics. Here's an optical example where um, we, uh, you are looking at Yeah, where you're looking at Newton's rings, right? Some uh, uh, an interference, a wave interference phenomenon. And again, uh, I showed you that there's that circle tool, so there's another perfect place where that comes in real handy. You're able to measure the rings on something like this using Tracker quite uh, quite accurately, and 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 then compare that with uh, with uh, theory. Uh, there's uh, some other examples of, uh, of using tracker in optics, and that is in spectroscopy experiments. Tracker has a tool here called the uh, line profile, and a line profile is, uh, is, a, is a tool that measures the brightness of whatever, uh, whatever it goes over. You, it has some width. You can give it some width and so forth. So you, you can move it around and, 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 and measure whatever you want. The nice thing is the tracker has the facility to, uh, as, long as, you, as long as you have some laser spots uh, that you include in the spectrum and the laser spots have known wavelength, then tracker has the facility to, to uh, actually calibrate this in uh, nanometers. And, and uh, so you end up being able to get a spectrum that enables you to uh, get uh, numerical values for, let's say, the helium spectrum. Or here's another example where, again, there's actually two side-by-side -side, uh, line profile tools. And, and this was where you had a, uh, this is an experiment in which there was an incandescent lamp. And then, and it was a vertical filament on an incandescent lamp. Over the top half of the lamp, uh, we held a, a color filter. So the top line profile here, this one, is showing me the spectrum that we see through the color filter. This is the unfiltered spectrum. And even though this is in grayscale, right, this has just been made, made into a grayscale thing, so that so you don't you're not being, you know, uh, influenced by any kind of colors in there. Uh, but this enables students to to see what uh, color filters do. And you know, you, the challenge would be, can you identify the color of the filter by just looking at these at the spectra? Here's another third example where this high resolution spectrum was uh, pulled down off the web. And if you use a line profile tool on that, you see that you can get a great deal of uh, detail here and measure, uh, measure the absorption lines in the solar spectrum. So that's an example of something where a tracker can be applied in, a, in a, uh, an astronomy class. I've got a couple, of, a couple other examples of, uh, of where Tracker could be used in astronomy. Here's one that was put together by Mario Belloni, who is one of Wolfgang's uh, colleagues. Uh, he got a series of uh, still images from NASA, and these are available for download. And uh, when you, I, I can't, I won't show you the, the, uh, the video as you play it, but uh, you can take a series of still images and, and put them in Tracker, and, and it just plays them as though it would have any other video. And when you do that, of course, you're going to see, you know, you see the rotation of the sunspots. So it's a nice example of where you can use Tracker to track the sunspots and measure the rotation rate. Uh, he had another one here where he was measuring the sidereal day by looking at, at uh, the stars in the night sky. 
uh, determining G from a water stream is kind of a clever one. Let me just shut that down. So. Um, here. All right. This is a video. It's not much of a video. Maybe it's not a video. I guess it's a still image. But it's a very clever idea this guy had. It's an image of, we can see just a water stream coming down off of a tap. And of course, it, as it flows, it picks up speed. And as it picks up speed, the stream narrows because of the continuity equation. And so he, was, uh, he said, well, you know, if we simply measure the diameter of the stream as a function of height, as long as it's calibrated, and that's what that uh, meter stick is there, so we know what the height is, and then we can apply the continuity equation, we could figure out the value of g from this. That's a pretty clever idea, and, and you get good results, and it's a, an application where now we can uh, we're actually using, uh, we're, we're applying tracker in, um, in, uh, in the field of fluids. Here's another example. Here's a video where you have uh, particles coming in and moving across. Can you see them? It's kind of dark there, but there were, uh, where there's, uh, the, the, and so you can see these dark, uh, the particles, you can see it a little bit better directly on the screen and you could use tracker to bring up the brightness and the, and the contrast. And by measuring the speeds of those particles over the top of the wing and the bottom of the wing, we can start to uh, get a, a handle on, on uh, lift. Wind tunnel. Uh, a couple other examples. Now these are in E&M. And I won't show you this because it's kind of a boring video. You can see what, a, you know, what this is about. But you, you, you had a charge. That, the one hanging down is charged, and the other one coming in is charged. And as you get it closer, the one that's hanging from a string moves out. And you can measure the distance between those and the angle of the hanging one. And from that, determine, as long as you know the masses, determine what kind of a force there is. And you can, and you can uh, test Coulomb's law that way. Uh, and then another one in, out of the field of E&M uh, is uh, Andy Johnstone, who had students take videos of, their, uh, of the uh, electron beam in a magnetic field. Again, used the uh, circle fil fitter then to, to measure the diameters of those beams. You know, you'd say, well, this is a, 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 uh, an example of an experiment that could be done without tracker. You don't have to use tracker, but it's a way to uh, it's a way to record something and then go back and look at it again. It's, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it doesn't replace the real thing, but it, uh, it enables you to, to kind of revisit your experiment and, and double check the, uh, the data and so forth. So it's a nice way of getting, uh, getting some data that's associated with e &M. So that's what I'm going to stop there. Uh, but I hope I've convinced you that, you know, you, the, when you're going to use Tracker to do video analysis, you're not just talking about velocity and acceleration. There's really much more. And the, you can search the collections and find a lot more. Uh, and, and like Red Elaine does, you know, think outside the box. And, and there's really quite a bit you can do with it. So thank you. I'd be happy to take any questions. So maybe I have a quick question. Yes, please do. So, so uh, Tracer, thank you for designing this. I use it in my class. You do? Good. Um, well, n n as far as I know, not specifically with Tracker, but there have been studies in the past where 
uh, where the where video analysis uh, as a general tool was looked at. Uh, Priscilla Laws did a lot of uh, work with with uh, video analysis uh, earlier on, and as you probably know, uh, Vernier uh, has in his software includes some some uh, video analysis tools. Um, so there have been studies in the past, and those have been published. Uh, but as far uh, even in those cases, you know, a, a real uh, a real per uh, sort of study where there's control groups and so forth. I don't know that I'm familiar. Are, did you know of any? So the answer is really not exactly no. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much. sales speech about the work that we've been, done, we've been doing. Uh, the reason is because uh, under the funding initiative that we have uh, been allowed to bring these two professors to come to Singapore to give a workshop and these public lectures. So uh, related to Prof South's question about what kind of research that we have done, uh, actually in our project is called EduLab. In the, under the funding, we have actually conducted and published two uh, papers. Both are open access papers. One actually is a case study. Uh, with Kim Kia in, in our midst and then uh, what we actually found in a nutshell is that the student uh, did find that the physics learning of a free fall toss-up motion using uh, Douglas Brown's uh, video to be effective uh, and the uh, effect size was around 0 0.7 so it is quite, uh, quite a big uh, effect size uh, because you have to understand that this research was done with very little preparation. The teachers were the first time uh, using the tracker tool, and they were able to enact it with 123 students in this case study. So we were quite happy with it. Of course, in the paper, we suggested different ways to improve the effect sizes. And in a different, uh, in a similar project, <laughs> in the same project, another paper that we uh, published was on the physics performance tasks. So if you're not familiar with it, basically what we do is in, uh, in Raffles Girls School, we got an entire cohort of 300, uh, 270 students, or the uh, Raffles Girls, to conduct a physics experiment of their own choice. And we were very pleased with the kind of work that the students produced. So some can even analyze the motion of a bird. We had a minor that uh, she flimmed and then the minor flew. So this girl, uh, sec three only, went on to describe the motion uh, through equations, I believe, and then found out that as the, if I, I mean, I won't be able to describe it as in detail as uh, Zi Kuang will be able to, but in a nutshell, we were very impressed <laughs> for a secretary to be able to say as a bird stroke and then there's more, uh, more, uh, up, more lift and all that. And then because of the different cycles and all that, that's why the, the bird was able to achieve a net upward force. So there were a couple of different examples. There's so many, because it is a physics performance task, it is quite difficult for us to say, okay, wait, let's sit down all of them and take a test, like what, would you, would, what you would like to do in a control experiment uh, setup. Uh, but we were still, nevertheless, very pleased with the amount of work that the student put into the, the video analysis. And all our work is not hidden secret. We publish it. In journals, we put it up in our own digital library uh, together with uh, Douglas' work uh, in, our, in our own uh, Singapore digital library. So I strongly urge you to not take my word for it uh, that Tracker did work for our many students. I encourage you to try it out on your own so that you can too also experience the, the little successes that you may see from your students learning more uh, happily and enjoying uh, themselves. Okay, with that, uh, can we go for a quick break and come back by 4.05? Thank you so much.
Okay, thank you very much for coming back for the second part of the public lectures. So the next lecture will be on open source physics by Professor uh, Wolfgang Christian. And uh, without much introduction, I'm going to let him uh, continue because in the interest of time. Okay. All right, well, again, thank you, uh, Liu Kang, for inviting Doug and myself to, uh, to present here in Singapore. And uh, thank you for the wonderful, warm reception that uh, everybody's given us since we've been here. Um, today, I'd like to talk to you about the Open Source Physics Project and some of the new developments that have occurred um, over the last year. Um, as we all know that you know, current technologies really do allow educators to integrate uh, computation and computational physics and modeling, computer modeling into instruction. In this talk, I'm going to describe some of the technologies that we've developed um, in the open source physics project and um, hopefully show you how you can use them in your own curricular development projects. The talk is based on Tracker, the video analysis program that Doug talked about in, in the first hour. It's based upon easy Java and JavaScript simulations, which is an authoring tool developed by Francisco Escambre in uh, University of Murcia in Spain. And then uh, it's all wrapped up together in the open source physics compadre digital library. Um, so that's the three legs of our, our uh, program upon which we build our project. I think we all realize that we need digital libraries. Um, if you do a Google search for Pendulum, I did this this morning over breakfast, I had 27 million hits. Um, if I do Pendulum simulation, so putting quotes around the two words, so the two words have to appear together in the Google search, I only get 11,900 simulations hits. If I don't put quotes around, I get about a half a million. So clearly, um, there are probably about 11,000 pendulum simulations out there on the internet. The problem, of course, is that most of these simulations are animations that fake the physics, and Doug has shown us how you can fake physics in many different ways with Tracker, um, and they're inappropriate for teaching. There's usually no instructional material um, that can be used by teachers and no information about how that material um, was created or how it's correlated to national science standards. Most of the simulations really support a passive viewing pedagogy, so you just see something moving on the screen, right? And there are no questions or interaction between the student and the simulation. And then, um, you know, so in order to really be effective for instruction, the simulation needs to be easy to find. It needs to be simple, adaptable, adoptable, and the coupled with support content for students and for teachers. Well, how do we do this? Well, when I was a, a bit younger, I used to run my own website. But ever since you know, the, the uh, web has gotten to be international, there are many more bad actors out there in the web. We've gotten hit with spyware, you know, people coming in and trying to put viruses on our site and so on. So a few years ago, I decided I am out of the business of trying to run a website because you know, the Chinese and the CIA and you know, everybody else, they, they crack websites all the time. I was going to let experts do this. So I'm now working through the National Science Digital Libraries hosted in, uh, by the AAPT. Right. That gives us a lot of benefits because I don't have to spend my time running a website. We get standard and custom library and web services. We get connections to other digital libraries. There's a chemistry digital library. There's a geosciences digital library. There's a math digital library and on and on. Right. So you become part of a national network. We currently have about 600 Java simulations and that's growing. Um, we have about 150 JavaScript simulations. I think Andy is going to send us another one any day now. Um, so it'll be, you know, we grow, you know, by about three or four a month. 
they're all uh, reviewed by myself or one of the other editors. So you're not going to find um, uh, 11,000 pendulum simulations. You'll find three or four pendulum simulations, but they will be documented and you can get the source code. Um, you ha we have about 1,200 Fizzlet physics pages, and I'll say more about that in a few minutes. And then we get about 10,000 visitors a month. Many of them are repeat visitors. We get about 5,000 simulation downloads a month. So in a year, we have 60,000 simulations that are downloaded and distributed to teachers. So we're probably one of the, the major providers of simulations for physics education in the world. Um, what we offer is we offer individual items. So we are a very modular digital library. So here's an item uh, dealing with uh, quantum superposition. Um, those items, you can find them by doing a search. If you can't read this, don't worry about it because we're going to do this live in just a minute. The idea here is to just kind of show you the big picture of what the library can do for you. And then, of course, you can take what you find and you can put it into your personal filing cabinet that um, allows you to organize the material that you find. So let's, let's try this. Let's do a search. All right. So it turns out that on the Macintosh, what you see and what I see is not the same because Microsoft, when you're in PowerPoint, hides um, oh, so I'm going to escape from Microsoft. It's taken over my the second screen. So I have to do this. Okay, so here is the digital library. This is Compadre. All right. It is www.compadre.org, um, and then there are various collections. Ours is the OSP. If you just search for open source physics, we're easy to find. You shouldn't have any trouble finding us. You'll see that Doug, we have just added uh, some new material. So if the material, the PowerPoints that Doug showed and that we had in the workshop, if you'd like to go back tonight and you'd like to see what we said, right? Because um, you know, you can, I just uploaded the PDF of this talk, of Doug's talk, and from the workshops we're doing at, uh, with Liu Kang, it's a new item right here, so we can click on this. So if you're, you know, we've had some requests for the PowerPoints. So up here, we have a search. So I claim that for standard physics topics, we have a lot of material. So I'm going to stick my neck out here, and somebody's going to chop it off, <laughs> because I'm going to ask you, what should I search for? And you know, it's got to be a mainstream physics topic, you know, uh, protein, you know, re uh, recombinant DNA or protein folding and things like that is probably not going to be in this library. Uh, or parallel uh, computing clusters is not going to be in this library. Mm -hmm. Well, quantum mechanics, that's a very broad topic, but that certainly is a place to start. All right, so we would do and I have to, uh, quantum. Okay, so let's do quantum, let's do quantum spectroscopy. Spec. Let's see if we get a hit if we put in both of those terms. And we get fluorescence spectra, and uh, if we look at this, in fact, we get one of Doug Brown's tracker video analysis programs. So tracker material is in here, and you can, in fact, it's a zip file that you can unzip, and then you do a, get a tracker experiment. So that was nice and narrow. You had a nice narrow topic, and maybe you wouldn't have thought that you can do video analysis on spectra, but in fact you can, and tracker does very well on that. If I just typed quantum, maybe a, a superposition. I'll narrow it just a little bit. You'll see that we have 39 
uh, uh, things on quantum superposition. So I have a quantum superposition program. I have uh, quantum momentum. Um, so there are lots of things here with quantum superposition. For instance, here is a quantum carpet, all right, which is a, um, a space-time diagram of a quantum wave function, I think, bouncing inside a um, uh, uh, hard walls. All right? And we also have, let's say, the Wigner function um, uh, a simulation and things like that under quantum mechanics. These are JAR uh, Java archives. So this program, you would click, it would go onto your desktop, and you double click and you run it. So let's try one more. Somebody else brave enough to chop off my head? Brownian motion. Brownian motion, okay. I'd have to spell it correctly. That's the first thing that goes, of course, when you get older is you wear bifocals. <laughs> so here we have two things. So we have uh, innovative uses of video analysis, again, by Doug Brown and Ann Cox. And you must have a Brownian motion video that you actually, uh, that you actually look at. So again, we get a piece of um, um, you know, video analysis. We might try something like random walk. All right, and for, so random walk is you know kind of Brownian motion. We have a simulation on a solar neutrino walking out from the sun. It's Brownian motion. Uh, we have random walks in 1D, continuous random walk model. We have a 2D uh, self-avoided random walk model, um, and so on. So there are, in fact, lots of random walks um, kind of related to Brownian motion. So sometimes you have to find the right term. Um, for random walks, we had 27 different applications and simulations. So you can see that the digital library um, really has lots of things in it. And of course, we're trying to add more as we collect them and, uh, from our collaborators and also develop our own. Now, when you find something like a random walk, OK, so here is a, here's a solar neutrino. Um, and it's scaled properly. It is scaled. This is a real physics simulation. This is not an animation. Um, that, that the actual, if you look at it, the, you know, it's a, you know the, the units have to be scaled, but it's a real random walk of a photon trying to get out of the sun. Um, you'll find something like this, and you'll say, OK, I want to use this a month from now in my statistical and thermal physics class. So what you should probably do is you should say, all right, Let's come down and let's take this um, random walk and let's add it to, um, in a, to somewhere in a filing cabinet. So I'm going to take the random walk program and I'm going to put it into a folder. And just for fun, I'm going to put it into a folder on quantum mechanics. So this is a shared filing cabinet folder. I'll save it, right? And then in my folder, for some reason, on quantum mechanics, with all my quantum mechanics simulations, I now have a link, right, a bookmark, if you will, to a simulation dealing with random walks. If you come back up here, you can see that here are um, some other quantum mechanics simulations that I have bookmarked. All right. These, by the way, are all in JavaScript. So these simulations will run on tablets, on iPhones, and um, you know, on devices that may not have Java installed on them. This one happens to be a Java program. And of course, as you might expect, you can also have subfolders here. So Java models, uh, packages of simulations, and uh, because when I teach, this is from my course, by the way. When I teach quantum mechanics, I do a lot of math methods. I mean, you have to teach about Fourier analysis, orthonormal functions, and so on. 
and so I have bookmarks to those. So this is how you're supposed to use the digital library. You're supposed to find, for the open source physics collection, right? you would find individual simulations and items that you'd want to use, and then put them into a file folder right? that you can then send the students this link to, and the students can get all of the simulations that you might use in your particular course. All right, so that is, um, uh, in a nutshell, um, kind of how the digital library is designed and how I would use it to teach. All right, so that. All right, the, the other thing that's in the digital library um, are the, uh, these open source, uh, these uh, Fizzlet books. Um, the, the really hard thing when you're trying to teach with um, simulations is you can find a simulation here, you can find a simulation there and elsewhere, but it takes an awful lot of work to put together a curriculum that spans an entire academic year or an entire course. In 2003, we did this for introductory physics starting with kinematics and going up through E&M and optics. That was called the Fizzlet Physics Book. And then a few years later in 2013, Mario Bologna and I did the same thing for quantum mechanics, right? And then we created um, a set of simulations starting essentially with uh, modern physics, special relativity, and working up through the standard introductory quantum mechanics problems. That's very hard to do, and that is, you know, more or less the could be, you know, it's the work of many, many years and many collaborators. Let me show you uh, what Fizzlet physics now looks like. It's kind of interesting if you've ever written a textbook. You write a textbook and you you give the, the, the rights to that textbook to the publisher, and then basically you feel like you've given away, you've sold your child. You're like, you know, Rapunzel or somebody, you know, you've given it away and your publisher has all, all the power that they want over you. That's not true. If you go to the publisher, because the technology changed, this came out on a CD, the technology changed, and if you go to the publisher and you say, I want to do a second edition of my book with new technology, JavaScript, online, things like this. If the publisher says no, the law says that they have to give you the rights back so you can do the second edition with another company or whatever you want to do because it's restraint of trade if they hang on to your material. They're restraining you from free trade. And so I was able to get back the rights from my publisher for Fizzlet Physics, and then with the people, you know, the good people in Compadre, right, we were able to put all this in Compadre. So for instance, here uh, under optics, all right, if you look at optics, we do E&M waves, mirrors, refraction, and lenses, and so on. So let's just take a look at one of the lens problems. Here's a lens problem. It says, let's see if we can slide this over. No, I guess not. All right, so the question is, there's a mirror here. What's the focal uh, length of that mirror? And so the student, you know, when, when they're learning this in introductory physics, they would say, okay, well, there's the focus right here. And so the lens is right here. It's at, uh, it's at about uh, 3.75. Right here is this 1. Uh, you know, 1.5, something like this. They subtract the two numbers, and they tell you what the focal length is. Of course, that's wrong, right? In order to answer this question, you have to do some things. And that's the key, isn't it, in order to get um, to have learning take place. So what do you have to do for this simulation right here to find the focal length of that mirror? Okay. 
This is a test. <laughs> Getting into <laughs> National University of Singapore depends on you answering this correctly. What are you going to do? Oh, get parallel rays. Excellent idea, right? So you have to immediately come in, and it already it shows that, well, if I can find the point where I can get parallel rays right, to come out, there's the focal point right there. And now I just get the distance from here, right, from over here to here, and I've got the answer. OK, that's one solution. Any other solutions? All studied optics. very American, I know, putting you on the spot like this. <laughs> yes? Move it up. OK, does moving it up work? Right? Well, you can kind of see that it's kind of interesting. This is how a telescope works. You've got these stars far, far away, and they all tend to focus in this plane. So there's really not a, there's actually a focal plane in a mirror, which is an interesting idea. But I need to find the focal length, because that's the answer that I have to put bubble in on my entrance exam to the, your university or something like that. What's another way to find the focal length? What could I do? What about right here? What's this point? What has just happened at that point? And the lens, right? The light rays go out, hit the mirror, and they come right back. Where is, where is that point? Where am I? At the, at, if you're in a spherical shell and the light goes out and comes right back, where are you standing? At the center, right? That's the radius of curvature. And if you've read the chapter, right? Did you, you did your homework last night, right? You read the chapter. The focal point of a spherical lens is related how to the radius of curvature of the sphere? It's half. Yeah. So there's another point to do it, another way to do it. Now, in a textbook problem, they would tell you, you know, an object is, you know, four feet away from a mirror, you, uh, it comes to a focus, you know, a 0.5 feet away, and find the focal length. And what do the students do? They run to what formula? Yeah, you know, one over the focal, one over the object distance plus one over the image distance is one over the you know, focal length. So a lot of students will actually run to that formula right away, and they can use that formula here. You can certainly look for an object distance and an image distance with this simulation, right? So here is the object, here is the image. You can measure the distances. You go to the formula, plug it in, plug and chug. But at least the student has to recognize to do that. Right, that the focal uh, point is not this point right here. The focal point is where a parallel ray comes in and crosses the axis, so it's somewhere in here. There are four or five ways to answer this question. All of those ways require that the student think and interact with the problem. The student is not given a single number to do this exercise. And that is what makes a good interactive exercise that probes the student's deep understanding of the topic, right? where they have to 
do more than just find the right formula to ent enter the, the expression. You, if you go back and lo you look, right, there's mechanics, excuse me, Newton's laws, problems, lots of problems on Newton's laws, right? So it says you want to run this, you've got free body diagrams, right? You're asked to find which, you know, to look at the free body diagrams and tell us which of them are correct. There are lots of things to do. Um, it's still a great resource. The only problem with this resource <clears throat> is it, no long, it only runs in certain browsers, and it only runs on computers. It does not run on tablets, and unfortunately, because there are lawsuits between Google and Oracle, right, the Google has now stopped supporting Java applets. But you can run it on Mozilla, Safari, Internet Explorer, and all of these applets will run just fine. So anyway, we're, we're hard at work on trying to redo all of these simulations in JavaScript so that they run on all platforms again. Uh, we've done about 150 of them, um, and hopefully as soon as I finish my, you know, get really into retirement, um, I'll, I'll get back to work on redoing this, this book so that it's all JavaScript compatible. Okay, so that's Fizzlet Physics, and that made a pretty good splash in the education community. 50% um, of all U.S. faculty members know about Fizzlet Physics and uh, consider it to be a, a PER validated technology. If you look at the taxonomy of, of learning, all right, we kind of ten, re remember about 10% or so of what we read. Um, I enjoyed Harry Potter, but I'm sorry, I can't remember all the details on all those books. My son and I read them together. Um, you know, we, about 20% of what you hear, so if I'm lucky, you'll remember 20% of what I say today, tomorrow morning when you wake up for breakfast. If you see it and hear it, maybe 30%. Right? So you've seen the simulations. You'll remember how to move that thing around, right? You've heard me ex kind of explain it. So the next time you get that problem on a test, you'll know how to do it, I hope. 30% of you, maybe 40%. And I do get, we do get very good learning gains uh, by using these interactive problems. Um, all right, and so if you keep going right on, when you actually end up discussing and explaining what you have just seen to your neighbor, you get tremendous learning gains. Now, who makes use of that pedagogy in their teaching? Very famous educator in the US. Eric Mazur, peer instruction, right? This is you know, Eric Mazur's thing, and he does get very good learning gains in his classes. He will give the students problems like that, find the focal length, and then, he just sits back, he asks the students to vote on you know, what, what the correct answer is, and then the students have to talk to each other. And by doing so, by explaining it to another student, the students learn. There's the old joke that you probably don't learn quantum mechanics until you have to teach it to a class. And that was probably true of me, right? I had pro I you know went through Sakurai and uh, um, Messiah or Messiah um, you know and Liboff and so on as an undergraduate and graduate student. But until I had to teach quantum mechanics, I don't think I understood beans about quantum mechanics. So it's a, one of the great pleasures of being a, uh, a, a physics faculty member is you get to learn the stuff. All right. Um, so, but if you really do the real thing, if you simulate the exper experience and try and create computer models yourself, the learning is much deeper. We saw that in the workshop where the teachers in the workshop were actually doing simple harmonic motion, pendulum motion, um, and so on. And we had tremendous fun yesterday in the workshop by doing this and I would bet you that we have learning gains and people really understanding tracker and video analysis and the motion that they were studying um, much better than what we have now. Oh, let me get back, whoops. I was in author mode and I created a new slide. 
So if you'll excuse, let me get back into presentation mode. So here is the slide I just created, it has nothing. So the next step I claim in teaching is, okay, I, I introduce all of these um, simulations to my students. At some point, no, I want the students to actually create their own simulations. Now, that's hard to do in high school. I understand that. But in college, all right, we do do it. We do it a lot. So I'm going to, do you want me to go until 5 or 5.15? 5.10. OK. I think I have enough time to, to do this. All right. So I'm going to open up our modeling tool. And then I'll go back and I'll show some student projects from Davidson College. So I'm opening them up EJS, Easy Java Simulations. And I'm going to do one of the best ideas that I've had in 40 years of teaching, and that's working with Paco. All right? You always, if you work with smart people, you just get smarter yourself. And what we've been able to do is exactly what Doug does is that we can connect the EJS digital uh, authoring tool to the national digital libraries. So just like Doug is able to download video experiments directly into Tracker, if we press this button right here, it will go to a digital library. And let me look at colliding. Hmm? Oh, I'm OK. Microsoft did it to me again. All right, so here I am in EJS. All right, I typed in, I am in the EJS tool right here. All right, and let me close that for a minute. So this is Easy Java Simulations. I come here, and I connect to the digital libraries, and I searched for colliding. And you'll see that there are lots of collision simulations in the digital library, balls in a box bouncing around, Leonard Jones potential, uh, gas simulations, things like this. The one I'm going to show you is colliding galaxies. Right? So. It goes to the digital library, says, where do you want to put it? I'm going to put it in a directory called testing, right? just because you know, I'm, I don't want to mess up the original. This is a student project that was done by a sophomore who has since gone on to Columbia and then on to graduate school. This student, as a sophomore, was interested in galaxy formation. I mean, what student isn't? Right? I mean, it's one of the great ideas you know, that physicists orbits and you know, how do galaxies form, where are we going, where, where do we come from? And he found a paper by Tomare in 1972 from the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center in which he actually took two galaxies and had them pass close to each other. The galaxies started out spherically symmetric. And then he saw the formation of spiral arms. So this student did this. And he did it in EJS. So I'm going to hit this magic red button, which compiles the program. And when you run the program, all right, you have this is a galactic core, which has most of the mass. He doesn't put the stars on that core because he wanted to see the effect of one galaxy passing around another galaxy. The galaxy that he was looking at was initially spherically symmetric. So we have a galaxy here with a galactic core and about 100 stars orbiting about that core. And when the second galaxy comes through and passes past that galaxy, you get the formation of spiral arms. He more or less reproduced Tomare's results. For, and then he went beyond that, right? looked at some other things. Now, the interesting thing is that Tomare did it at the Supercomputing Center in 1972 using the most powerful computer in the United States. 
my student did this, right, about 25 or 30 years later on a desktop computer running in real time. All right, Tomare and Tomare's work was so pioneering, they got one of these MacArthur Genius Awards where the MacArthur Foundation gives you a million dollars and says, do something interesting, and they don't even make you write a report. <laughs> All right, so it allowed the student at a very early age in his career to engage in real honest to God physics research, right, research topics, right, using computational physics. And again, um, at the end of the, the uh, term, the student had to present this work to his and her peers, right, and that's just a wonderful way to engage students in active learning. So that, that basically, in a nutshell, is what we can do with um, EJS. There we go. All right. EJS allows us to bring computation into the physics curriculum at a very early stage. Oh, and there's one last thing I just kind of need to show. When I, I of course, had to grade this thing. All right. So here is the EJS model. I can look at the model. The evolution here. Those are the evolution equations. So this is the derivative. This is star x position, star x velocity, star y position, star y velocity. And the coding that the student did is right here, all right, where he loops through the stars and does one over inverse square law force interactions between all the stars. Now, of course, so it's Newton's law. Right? It's freshman physics, all right? but of course he has to learn how to write Java code um, to, in order to do it, so he has to learn how to create loops, right? he has to um, do it efficiently, and more importantly, the student has to document his code. If you don't document your code, you're not going to get an A from me. All right? So that is all part of the process of um, learning, you know, talking about what you have to do, and then presenting it to your peers, right? And so this is why EJS is, is such a powerful tool, because it forces the student to go through the documentation to define variables, right? Um, to actually um, then initialize them to document the code and so on. So it teaches structured programming. Right? Unlike what I see happening so often, the student is given a project, you know, is told to write some code. If the code works, the professor says, oh, that's very good, right? pats the student on the back. And then the student walks out the door, gets a job, and another graduate student comes in and says, what in the world does that code do? <laughs> right? Because they can't understand the code that the last student wrote. Um, all right, so that's my, uh, you have to excuse my rant uh, about, um, computational instruction the way it often occurs. OK, so that's how we use EJS. Um, computer models um, really are wonderful things. They allow students to think about things in terms of simpler artificial things, because they have to abstract the real world into this computer code abstraction. Exploratory models engage the student in ideas presented by an expert. Me, I assign homework problems and exercises. But in the end, all right, um, the modeling and the programming activities are really expressive exercises that require the students to kind of put in their own ideas and assumptions and create concrete representations of their ideas that appear on the computer screen. And that's why I think it's such a powerful learning pedagogy. In the modern curriculum, it is a crime not to teach students about computational thinking. Every physicist, every researcher thinks computationally in so many different ways, whether they're doing data analysis, whether they're doing theory, right, whether, whether they're doing visualizations. If you're going to teach students in a modern curriculum, you have to teach them about differential equations and numerical algorithms. 
and you do oscillators, Newtonian orbits, few body problems. You have to teach them about partial differential equations and boundary value problems. Laplace equation, Poisson equation, Schrodinger equation, they're all PDEs, right? And they have to know how to attack them computationally. They have to look at some stochastic models and do some Monte Carlo algorithms. This should be part of the undergraduate curriculum throughout, uh, you know, throughout our universities. And then, of course, chaos theory, uh, logistic maps. Do problems where there are no analytic solutions. Um, and then, more importantly, the students have to do a final project. So here's another project. This is Dan Martin. He did a project on earthquakes, and his project consisted of essentially a plate with blocks of different mass sitting on a plate that's moving, connected with springs to another plate that's moving. And it turns out that when one of those masses lets loose, it can lead to a small earthquake, but occasionally the stress builds up in the system where you end up with a massive earthquake. Gives very good agreement with what happens here on the Pacific Rim, for instance. Right. So this was his project. He went on, he um, you know, was a 4 student, was a wonderful student, but he has had to do this and then create a poster and present it in a research symposium at the end of the semester. We have a research symposium every May where we have uh, 2,000 students at Davidson College. About 150 students show their work that they did during the semester to the other, to their peers. And you know, my students have to do that as part of this course. All right, so um, the Colliding Galaxies is in the digital library. It's actually then put, I put it into a file folder where the, uh, I collect all my students' work, all right, so that other people can find it and look at it and see what the students have been doing. Um, so we're now going, thinking of ways that we can better organize the material in Compadre. So traditionally, this is actually a bookshelf in my office, right? right? The students would do work, they'd turn in papers, and I'd read the papers and grade them, I'd put them on a shelf if I liked them. Um, and so the next step was to actually take my uh, student work and put it into compadre and put it into filing cabinets. What we can now do is we can do a transformation on the back end to transform the filing cabinet into what we call a compadre book. Right? So um, I've done a number of these. I have a book on uh, why is there wealth inequality with Harvey Gould, Jan Tabachnik. I've got uh, with Chandra Lekha Singh, uh, a time evolution of wave function quilt. And I've got some other books that I've put together. So the book I'm going to show you is the Waves and Interactions book. So let me pop back, let me click on this. It goes back to Compadre. Of course, you can't see it because of Microsoft, right? So I'll have to jump back out to my browser. All right, so here we are. So you'll see this is the basic filing cabinet, right, where I've taken individual items and I've put them, I have bookmarks for them in a compadre filing cabinet. We can take this metadata, this material, and put it into a book. And so that filing cabinet was transformed behind the scenes, right? I didn't have to do anything, and it's the beauty of working with computer scientists. And it, we get this type of an interface, all right? So we can have a chapter on basic properties of waves, then we can have a chapter on combining waves. We can have a chapter on external interactions and applications. It's beginning to look like an electronic book. It's on the web, runs in browsers, runs on plat uh, mobile devices, whatever. So I could, for instance, come on combining waves. And I can say, well, here's a ready-to-run model um, adding two waves together on superposition. Here's one on interference. So this is JavaScript. It, for those of you familiar with Fizzlets, there was a Fizzlet just like this. Um, 
And so here's the left wave, here's the right wave, right? But if we combine them both together, it looks like this. So this is the old wet ripple tank that you'd set up in the front of your lecture demo hall. Of course, now we can change the separation and you can see the orders uh, occurring and so on. So I don't have time to go through everything in the book, but I think you'd probably agree that the interface is really superior to the interface that we had before in the compadre filing cabinet. More importantly, go back to power here, all right. It's all the same technology. The technology that is now being developed is more or less converging so that we can take those same simulations that we created in EJS and initially put on the into Compadre as individual web pages. We can put those now into Compadre books but we can also create EPUBs. So if you go to my EPUB reader, so I use iBooks because I'm on a Mac. I think I've sold my soul to Apple sometimes. Here is the same book, the same simulations that you saw before running in as an EPUB, all right? So I'll come in here let me just do um, a very simple sine wave tutorial. So coming in here, so there we have a sine wave and the students are asked questions about the wave function in this book right here. Or we can come in and we can, let me look for the um, interference simulation, interference ripple tank simulation. We're now in, um, in the book right? And so we will do both waves again, all right, um, here. This is running in an EPUB, and that'll run just like that on a phone or a tablet, right? So you just go between the books, you can read it. Notice we use MathML to get very nice mathematics in the book, all right? Group velocity, phase velocity simulation right here, right? So we're moving into trying to distribute and create books that we can distribute through the iTunes store or the, the Android Play store. How was this simulation created? This is a quiz. Using what? What's our tool for creating simulations? Easy Java simulations, yeah. So the tool is so versatile that it can create single web pages, but it can also create EPUBs um, that we can distribute in other ways. All right, um, it's 10 after, and Liu Kang is going to have the, the hook here. We also have um, the EPUB reader, all right? Um, we have, uh, which is an, an applet, that runs that you can download and put on Android and iOS devices. And then of course the great thing is that we are making these simulations free, uh, available. We had a discussion over lunch about you know, what, what do you mean by making the simulation available. We're not making our, all our books and the narrative available, right? We can't do that, but we do give away the simulations. So Liu Kang has taken a lot of our simulations here and he actually adapts them for Singapore and he adds his own curriculum material to those uh, simulations. So here is Liu Kang's blog. So one of the great things about open source and being able to use and share with digital libraries is that other people can get the simulations and, and adapt them to their own needs. So what's my take home message? My, I've been doing this, I've been creating simulations. My first book was the Cups, Waves, and Optics in 1994. So I've been doing this a long time, but the, what I have learned over all these years is that you really need to work on the curriculum development from the start. Don't start with the program. Everybody loves the program, get a cool simulation. Start with the curriculum development. What is it that you want to teach? And then think about 
how you know you can implement a program to do the teaching. Focus on one concept or application for each simulation. You may take that simulation and adapt it four or five times to you know, show different concepts, but too many options distract, particularly when you're on a mobile device. One, a button, a run button, a stop button, a reset button, and maybe one option is sufficient. Don't try and change everything in one simulation. The devil is in the detail. A small practical problem can really ruin a, a grand plan. Um, now, if, if something doesn't work, it just messes up your talk. <laughs> and it's really hard to do new things in front of students. Right? It is hard to do just-in-time teaching, peer instruction, interactive lecture demonstrations, or for heaven's sakes, flipping the classroom. You know, only the bravest person in this room will try and flip their classroom to have the students read before they come to class and spend their class time talking to students and working with them one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, that takes somebody who is really gutsy to do that type of thing, although it is a great way to teach. Um, to teach students. All right, so real curriculum change takes, um, takes a lot of effort, and um, it takes time, right? As I said, 1994, 2004, 2014, right? So I've been doing this for 20 years, um, trying to develop this. The open source physics EJS Compadre platform really removes many of the complicated tasks involved in integrating simulations and modeling into the classroom. And hopefully EJS allows teachers and students to focus on the science so they don't have to focus on the computational uh, aspects of how do I create a button, a graph, things like this, or how, I, how do I distribute the material, right? Um, the last thing is, of course, I need to thank all of my coworkers and all of the contributors. My um, primary coworkers are Mario Bologna and Francisco Escambre Paco. Um, one of the great things about doing this is you get to go to interesting places like Singapore, <laughs> right? So I, I really have had a, a very rich career doing uh, developing interactive uh, curricular material. Here we are in, in Venice at a conference. But, you know, we've got lots of people, Harvey Gould, Jan Tabachnik, we're AJP editors, Todd Timberlake, Lou Kang has done lots of simulations that we've borrowed from him and he's borrowed from us. Um, it wouldn't work without Paco's sidekick, Felix Clemente Garcia, um, a Moodle plugin by Luis um, in, uh, in Madrid, and of course the compadre people, Bruce Mason, Lyle Barbado, Matt Rigsby, Carolyn Hall at AAPT. And there are many, many others, too numerous to mention, but I thought I would just give you some of the principals who are in our project. We've been published in most of the physics journals. You know, here we are on the cover of American Journal of Physics. Here we are on the cover of Physics Teacher, showing how to do, use Tracker, by the way, to measure the transit of Venus across the sun, which occurred, I uh, guess, two years ago. Had a nice article in Science and a prize from Science Magazine um, for the Open Source Physics Project. And in the very latest issue of the Physics Teacher, we have an article uh, on the art and science of teaching based upon open source physics. So that's in this month's issue. If you don't subscribe to the physics teacher and you're a teacher, you should. Or get your library to subscribe. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Questions? I think I'm on time. <laughs>